Welcome to the week nine lecture. I, this is going to be just a little bit different from the reading check. Um, your reading check has just questions from chapter nine, um, but the, this lecture is going to include some questions from chapter 10. So just be aware of that. The slave economies of the Chesapeake and the Low Country regions of South Carolina and Georgia developed along different lines due to the nature of the crops each region has produced and the shifting demands of international markets. In the Chesapeake, tobacco dominated the agricultural economy up until the 1790s. However, by the time of the American Revolution, the market for tobacco had begun to decline, and this downward trend continued into the post-revolutionary period. The cultivation of tobacco was also notorious for depleting the soil, which prompted many planters to move westward into new newer territories like Tennessee, Kentucky, and westward, western Virginia in search of fertile land. In response to these changes, many Chesapeake planters began shifting away from labor-intensive tobacco cultivation and towards less labor-demanding labor crops like wheat and corn. This transition required fewer enslaved workers, leading some plantation owners to rent out their enslaved laborers to smaller farms or to artisans and urban laborers in growing towns. As the demand for labor fluctuated, the prospects for emancipation slightly increased in the Chesapeake, even as the institution of slavery remained entrenched in the region. In contrast, the low country of South Carolina and Georgia was heavily focused on rice cultivation, a crop that enjoy, enjoyed strong international demand. Rice farming was labor intensive, requiring large number of enslaved workers to manage the irrigation systems and work in the fields. However, after 1815, the region began to experience increased competition, particularly from textile manufacturing in the north. This economic shift, combined with the introduction of the cotton gin, spurred a transition from rice to cotton cultivation in much of the region. Cotton quickly became the dominant cash crop throughout the Lower South, particularly as the demand for cotton grew both domestically and internationally. The expansion of cotton cultivation led to a corresponding increase in the demand for enslaved labor, especially as more land in the Lower South was opened for cotton production. With the end of the international slave trade in 1808, the, inter the internal or interstate slave trade within the United States flourished, moving enslaved people from the Upper South to the Lower South to meet the growing labor needs of cotton planters. The internal slave trade became a central aspect of the Southern economy as cotton solidified its place as the region's primary cash crop. While both the Chesapeake and the Low Country regions relied on slave labor, the differences in crop production and market demands led to distinct economic developments in each region. The Chesapeake saw a gradual decline in labor needs with the shift to cereal crops, whereas the Low Country experienced a surge in demand for enslaved workers as cotton cultivation expanded, making the internal slave trade a crucial part of the Southern economy. Within the harsh confines of slavery, enslaved people built cultural lives that centered on two vital institutions, family and religion. These institutions allowed them to carve out spaces of personal and communal identity, despite the brutal realities of bondage. Family was a cornerstone of enslaved life, providing emotional support and a sense of continuity in an otherwise oppressive environment. Enslaved families gave individuals a way to create their own lives within the boundaries of slavery, maintaining bonds that transcended the control of slaveholders. However, the family unit was highly vulnerable. Slaveholders often coerced enslaved women into sexual relationships, which could destabilize family life. The sale of enslaved people, particularly children, also tore apart families and communities. These sales were not only used as a means of punishment or debt settlement, but were also viewed by some slaveholders as a good source of income, especially when they viewed marriages among enslaved people as long-term investments in future offspring. 
Despite these risks, enslaved peoples maintained customs, such as surnames, that existed outside of the control and knowledge of their owners, underscoring their resilience and efforts to preserve familial identity. Religion became increasingly important in enslaved communities, especially after the Second Great Awakening, a religious revival that swept through the United States in the early 19th century. Many enslaved people joined Southern congregations, particularly Baptist and Methodist churches, which were closely associated with evangelical revivals. In other cases, they organized independent churches or met informally on plantations, using Christianity to express their spiritual beliefs and offer a source of hope. Enslaved people often reinterpreted Christian teachings to suit their own experiences, rejecting the white interpretations that framed slavery as a punishment for sin. They blended elements of Christianity with occult practices from West Africa, creating a unique religious culture that included the powerful use of spirituals and music to convey messages of resistance, sorrow, and hope. Large-scale organized resistance among enslaved people was rare, partly because plantations were small, dispersed, and slaveholders were hyper-vigilant in preventing rebellion. However, small acts of resistance were common, including running away, fighting with owners or overseers, sabotaging equipment, and stealing. These acts of defiance were ways for enslaved people to ass assert their agency, even in the face of overwhelming power. The most notable large-scale rebellion was led by Nat Turner in 1831. Turner, who believed he had received divine visions that revealed a battle between blacks and whites as foretold in the Book of Revelation, launched the bloodiest slave revolt in American history. During a solar eclipse, Turner and his followers hacked 55 white men, women, and children to death before being violently suppressed. Although slave revolts like Turner's were rare, they terrified Southern whites and led to swift and violent reprisals, further tightening control over enslaved populations. Through family, religion, and acts of resistance, enslaved people crafted a cultural life that offered a measure of dignity and humanity even as the institution of slavery sought to strip them of both. These cultural practices were a testament to their resilience and creativity in the face of profound oppression. The market revolution in the South unfolded in distinct ways compared to the North, with its economic development primarily focused on large plantations and cotton production. While the rest of the nation saw economic diversification and infrastructure improvements during this period, the South's economy remained centered on cotton cultivation and the institution of slavery. This concentration of wealth and prosperity in the hands of the largest plantation owners meant that most people outside of the planter class were excluded from the benefits of the expanding market economy. Rather than diversifying their economies, southern states and planters simply produced more cotton leading to the deepening entrenchment of slavery. Technological innovations in the South, such as the cotton gin, played a crucial role in increasing cotton production. The cotton gin, invented by Eli Whitney, dramatically sped up the process of separating cotton fibers from seeds, allowing planters to meet the growing global demand for cotton. In addition, machines were developed to press cotton into bales, making it easier to ship the raw product. These technological advancements reinforced the South's commitment to a cotton-based economy and the expansion of slavery rather than fostering economic diversification. Unlike the North, Southern state governments invested very little in internal improvements, such as roads, canals, and railroads, which limited the potential for a transportation revolution. As a result, transportation networks were less developed, and Southern cities served primarily as depots for plantation crops rather than centers of economic and industrial growth. Cities like New Orleans, Char Charleston, and Baltimore were important for transporting crops, but even these southern hubs were often bypassed. Instead, staple crops like cotton were shipped directly from southern plantations to northern cities like New York City, which handled international trade. In sum, the market revolution in the South was shaped by its focus on cotton production and slavery, leading to economic growth that was narrowly concentrated among the planter elite. 
The region's failure to diversify its economy and invest in infrastructure improvements limited the broader impact of the revolution and kept the South reliant on cotton and slavery well into the 19th century. The Second Great Awakening played a pivotal role in shaping the emerging middle-class culture that grew out of the market revolution. This religious revival moment was particularly influential along the Erie Canal, where preacher Charles Grandison Finney led revivals that emphasized personal morality and social reform. Unlike the earlier First Great Awakening, which focused on sinfulness and divine wrath, the Second Great Awakening called on men and women to actively improve the world by choosing to do right. This message resonated with people living in a time of rapid economic and social change, as the market revolution had demonstrated the human ability to shape and mold the environment through innovation and hard work. The values promoted by the Second Great Awakening had practical applications both in the home and workplace. The new emphasis on moral choice reinforced the division of domestic labor and led to what historians refer to as the feminization of domestic life. Mothers, rather than fathers, became the primary caregivers for children, raising them with love, reason, and morality, rather than fear. This shift contributed to the ideal of true womanhood, a set of cultural expectations for middle-class women that was disseminated through, through popular literature, like cookbooks, etiquette guidebooks, housekeeping manuals, sermons, sentimental novels, and magazines like Godey's Lady Book. Women were expected to embody the four key virtues of piety, purity, domesticity, and submissiveness, which became central to middle-class identity. The Second Great Awakening also sparked the rise of new religious sects and denominations. One of the most notable was Mormonism, founded by Joseph Smith in Western New York. Smith's visions led to the creation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church, which presented an alternative form of religious organization in response to the social disruptions caused by the market revolution. Mormonism emphasized a strong hierarchical structure led by male authorities, a model centered, a model that countered the weakening of traditional patri patriarchal authority in many other areas of life during this period. Despite facing intense persecution, the Mormons moved westward, eventually settling in Utah, where they established a strong, tightly-knit community. In these ways, religion not only provided moral guidance during a time of economic and social upheaval, but also defined the roles and responsibilities of men and women in middle-class society. The Second Great Awakening fostered a sense of individual and communal responsibility for moral reform while simultaneously reinforcing cultural norms around gender and family life. The market revolution brought profound changes to American society, and along with it, a new commercial popular culture emerged, particularly in cities. This culture flourished primarily in urban working class neighborhoods, where a vibrant subculture of young working men developed in stark contrast to the piety and moral strictness of the middle class. A defining feature of this subculture was its emphasis on drinking and manliness which was often measured by physical prowess. Saloons became a focal point for socializing, and many of the amusements of the common folk revolved around what were known as blood sports. Activities like cockfighting, ratting, and dogfighting, often held in saloons, became popular forms of entertainment, despite frequently being illegal. Prize fighting, which evolved into what we now recognize as boxing, also grew out of this working class subculture. The sport had strong ties to ethnic-based saloons, militia units, and street gangs, reflecting the rough and competitive spirit of the time. Prize fighters became heroes in their communities, embodying a form of man manliness grounded in physical strength and endurance. The theater also became a major source of entertainment, with minstrel shows being the most popular form. These shows, which featured white actors performing in blackface, were overt, overtly racist, portraying African Americans in demeaning and stereotypical ways. 
Minstrel shows typically included a mix of songs, dancing, and sketch comedy, and although they appropriated aspects of African American culture, they did so in a simplified and distorted manner. Despite their deeply offensive content, minstrel shows were widely attended and often included edgy political and social satire. It's important to note that no African American performers were allowed on stage in these productions, underscoring the racial exclusion that pervaded American entertainment. At the same time, improvements in printing technology allowed for the mass production of newspapers and novels, leading to the widespread availability of cheap reading material. Penny newspapers and dime novels became popular, with sensationalized content that captivated readers. These stories frequently highlighted the darker aspects of humanity, featuring crime, scandal, and corruption, while also presenting melodramatic heroes who ultimately triumphed over evil. In essence, the popular culture of the early 1800s revolved around themes of good versus evil, whether in the form of physical contests, theatrical performances, or printed stories, this culture reflected a belief in the struggle between moral righteousness and humanity's darker impulses. However, the way this culture manifested in working class life, especially in the subcultures of young men, often celebrated toughness, defiance of authority, and, em and an embrace of activities that challenged the moral norms of the emerging middle class.